Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, before we start, I'd like to make a quick note about constructive physics. Uh, constructive physics aims to derive the whole of a physical theory from a set of axioms and rules of inference. So in this talk, I'll present a mathematical, in fact, an algebraic representation of a class of physical phenomena, uh, namely wave phenomena. And I'll show that this representation can be abstracted into a more general and uh, I think more fundamental um, structure, and that would be an infinity topos. Specifying the physical representation as an instance of this more fundamental structure, the infinity topos, um, offers a construction of this physical phenomena, the theory surrounding this physical phenomena, these physical phenomena, um, from this mathematical structure, and, and that way provides a constructive um, perspective on the theory. Uh, so I'll illustrate the relevant phenomena with a simple example. Uh, let's see, cosmic blue. So let's consider um, the total lattice. This is actually a little bit of a simplification of the total lattice. The actual total lattice has a Hamiltonian that's a little bit more complicated. But let's consider the total lattice which is essentially a system of harmonic oscillators. So you can imagine a spring here, and this is a little block on the spring, and this dotted line will be equilibrium. So this displacement will denote Qn of t, where n is for the nth oscillator, and this oscillator has momentum. And this momentum is P n of t. And this is the nth oscillator. So it can be shown that this system is, can be char completely characterized by these two functions, that these, this nth oscillator. And this is because, well, the nth momentum is simply the mass of the nth oscillator times the velocity of the nth oscillator, which is just the time derivative. And so the mass is just the nth momentum over the nth velocity. And similarly, we have that the time derivative of the nth momentum, which is the nth mass times the nth acceleration, by Hooke's law, it's just negative the nth swing constant times the nth position. So as a result, uh, so therefore this spring constant is simply the quotient of the and the time derivative of the nth momentum and the nth position. It's negative that. So we have the mass and the spring constant can also be determined from these functions. So these two functions completely determine the nth oscillator. So let's consider the properties of this nth oscillator. Represent these energy properties in green. The kinetic energy of the nth oscillator is just the square of the nth momentum over twice the nth mass. And the potential energy of the nth oscillator is just the nth spring constant times the square of the nth position over two. So the Hamiltonian, the, essentially the, the energy of the nth oscillator is just the sum of these, and we'll factor out the two just to make it look nice. So what's the sum of, so what's the total Hamiltonian of all of the oscillators? Well, it's just, the sum of these individual Hamiltonians. 
So it's just one half times the sum for n the natural number. of the nth momentum squared over the nth mass plus the nth swing constant times the square of the nth position. I'm, yes, uh, I forgot the square here. So what, so now we can relate these properties with differential equations. Uh, so is, so is the total lattice just a bunch of isolated harmonic oscillators? Yeah, they're completely independent. Well, it's actually a little more complicated because the actual total lattice, um, there is a potential, it's modeling crystal lattices and you have a more complicated potential function that is related between the different oscillators. But this is a simplification that, uh, of independent oscillators that makes the wave behavior a little more obvious. Thank you. Sure. So uh, the velocity is the nth velocity is just the nth momentum over the nth mass. And it's easy to see that this is the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the nth momentum, because if you differentiate this, you just get twice times that one half, and you get this. And similarly, the time derivative of the nth momentum, as we said before, it's just negative the swing constant times the position. And this is negative the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the nth position. So now we get these two differential equations and they're actually important enough to uh, write them to just isolate the differential equations here. So, uh, so uh, we get these two equations. The derivative of position with this, that nth position with respect to time is equal to the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to the nth momentum. And the derivative of the of the nth momentum with respect to time is negative the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the nth position. So we get these two differential equations and they hold for any natural number n. We in fact have infinitely many of the os oscillators. So we have infinitely many of these differential equations. So how would we describe a single solution, a single solution to this system of differential equations? Well, a single solution is just an infinite set of functions, a countably infinite set of functions with Q1, Uh, Q1, uh, for some reason, I think, let's try, Q2, dot, 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 and then P1, P2, dot, dot, dot. So we have an incountably infinite set of functions. And equivalently, a solution is a space. And exactly how you construct this space so that it corresponds to the solution is a little abstract, but you can think of it that these functions form a basis for, these, for this space. So this system, the total lattice, is an example of an integrable system. write that down. It's an integral system. And that means that it's exactly solvable. You don't need to approximate the solutions, we can find them exactly. So it turns out that an integral system is precisely a system which can be written in lax form. 
which is the derivative of L with respect to T, with respect to time, is equal to the commutative bracket of L and P, where L and P are pseudo-differential operators, and you, either P is completely specified or it's specified as a function of L, and you're solving for the pseudo-differential operator L, which is defined by an infinite set of functions. And the solutions of lax form, or the lax form has solutions that are solitons. So what's a soliton? All right, so what is L? Is it just the something yeah, that specifies a, all the QIs and PIs? Yeah, it's a pseudo-differential operator that's uh, defined. As, it's not necessarily defined by the Qs and Ps in particular, but it's defined by an infinite set of functions and from which you could derive the Q and I and PI. Uh, so what's a soliton? Well, a soliton is a solitary wave. So it's essentially a wave that looks like this. It's just a pulse, and it doesn't change its shape as it, tra as it travels. It's just this shape, and it continues like that with time. And uh, it's clear that the position and momentum functions, uh, oh, a pseudo-differential operator. A pseudo-differential operator is an operator that sort of looks, I guess you would have, uh, you'd write it like this. Uh, yeah, F and uh, the other way. But essentially, it's like you have a minus n. It's a sum of taking of it's a sequence of differentiating a function. It's an operator that acts on functions, and it's just a sequence of differentiating the function and multiplying it by some other function. And you have a pseudo-differential operator is essentially for um, infinitely many n. So we have infinitely many functions that specify taking the derivative of function and multiplying it by this function, and then, I, and then you have a sum of those. So this pseudo-differential operator is completely defined by the infinite set, the countably infinite set of functions f, fn. And an integral system can be rewritten in terms of uh, this equation where we're solving for L or equivalently solving for this countably, these, this countably infinite set of functions. So that's what a pseudo-differential operator is. And any equation like this can be, can, has solute soliton solutions, which look like this. But what does it mean for an integral system like this to have soliton solutions? Because clearly the position functions and moment, the position and momentum functions here are not solitons, they're sinusoids. Well, all it really means for it to have soliton solutions is that it has wave behavior. It, that is, it can be rewritten in some form where we have soliton solutions. And in, therefore, integral systems are essentially, integral systems are wave, are representations of wave phenomena. And in fact, the wave, the wave equation itself, uh, make that a little better. The wave equation itself, which is just the second derivative of psi with respect to time, equals the speed squared times the second derivative of psi with respect to position, is a sort of degenerate integral system because it's one equation and it's linear. So it's a degenerate integral system with solutions of the form f of x minus ct. And in a sense, you can consi uh, consider these solitons because they do move in space without ch changing shape, essentially. But they don't need to be a single pulse. They can be sinusoids or anything, really. But so this is a degenerate integral system, and we have, therefore, that integral systems are wave systems. And we further have 
as we mentioned. Um, so what's the solution space of an integrable system? I write the, this in quotes because it's not really a space. It's a classifying, it actually classifies spaces. It's a collection of spaces. In a sense, it is perhaps better to think of it as it's a structure that classifies those spaces which solve the system. And this classifier, this classifying space of spaces is called the infinite dimensional Grassmannian. Let's write that down. So the solution space is still an actual space. It's just a space. It's actually a space, right? It's not exactly a space. The Grassmannian isn't. Uh, well, it, 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 there are many ways to think of a Grassmannian. It uh, can be thought of as an algebraic Cloudy, for instance. But it's uh, really, for the purpose of this lecture, it's better to think of the Grassmannian as a sort of a classifier of spaces. It classifies those spaces. In fact, we'll sort of be dealing with it as a category. Well, we will be dealing with it, it uh, as a category. And uh, to give some intuition on that, um, we should think about the fact that an infinity topos is essentially a structure that is similar to the category of spaces, the category of all spaces, with spaces uh, somewhat more abstract than we've looked at them here. But an infinity topos uh, is just a mathematical structure that is similar to the category of spaces. So uh, it's sensible to think maybe this Grassmannian has a representation as an infinity topos, uh, and it'll, that's what we'll show here. So we'll take a detour. It was actually uh, helpful that Noah discussed simplicial sets last week. Um, because I will be using simplicial sets heavily here, but I will still review them. So what is a simplicial set? Well, a simplicial set is actually a family of sets. It's a family of sets indexed by the uh, natural numbers. It's a family of sets, and we'll denote these sets as n, where n, where n is a natural number. And we have maps between those sets, those sets in this family. And of importance are the face maps, which will denote di, and they take the nth set to the n minus one set, and the degeneracy maps. Which will denote si, and those take the nth set to the nth plus one set. And these are required to fulfill um, a set of identities, but I won't get into those because we won't be dealing too much with them. So what is intuitively, uh, what are simplicial sets intuitively um, trying to represent? So I'll take this directly from Noah's lecture last week. So imagine we have this, these vertices, and we'll call these vertices are represented, are the elements, they're represented as the elements of S0. And we'll call those elements the zero simplices. And they have edges between them. 
and those will be represented as the elements of S1. So those are the one simple Cs. And then we have the triangles, which are the two simple Cs. Uh, and I won't draw the tetrahedra because I don't know how to draw a tetrahedra. So I'll just stop there. But you can imagine that this goes on. So now we're going to discuss uh, simplicial categories. I'll write this in red. Oh, gosh. So what's a simplicial category? Well, a simplicial category, like any category, it has objects, has morphisms between those objects, and uh, it has higher level structures, which are sort of like maps between morphisms. We'll call those two morphisms, and naturally we could have morphisms between two morphisms and get three morphisms and so on. And a simplicial set is characterized by the fact that it's enriched over the simplicial sets. That is the set of morphisms between any two objects A and B is a simplicial set. So it's sort of, an, uh, I'll develop the intuition here. Uh, we can consider simplicial sets and simplicial sets have one simplest uh, sign so it's zero simplicity of course they have zero simplices they have one simplices which intuitively connect zero simplices the, the edges and then we have two simple Cs, which are the higher level structures, like, in, like triangles, and so on. So it's intuitive that we can take these objects and make them zero simple Cs, and take these morphisms and make them one simple Cs, and so on. And formally, this is a functor. Make this right. This is a functor. And we'll denote this functor by n, and I'll we'll call it the nerve, or the simplicial nerve. But we can also go the other way. We can take a simplicial set and consider the zero simplices objects and the one simplices morphisms and get a simplicial category. So this functor that goes the other way, we'll denote like this, They'll call it the realization or simplicial realization. And this forms a joint pair, uh, which essentially is not an isomorphism because there isn't exactly a one to one relationship here between the objects of this cat, between the simplicial sets and simplicial categories, but there is a bijective relationship between relations between simplicial sets and simplicial categories. So it's not quite isomorphism, but the existence of such a pair of functors called an adjoint pair um, is a sort of weaker equivalence. Um, and this will be important. Uh, so we say that the realization is the left adjoint of the nerve. But we can actually do the same thing uh, for instead of simplicial cats, we'll uh, simplicial categories, we'll consider uh, simplicial, we'll consider topological spaces. Write this in red. So we can consider topological spaces. Write this with an uppercase S. No, actually, I won't. Spaces. And topological spaces are naturally characterized by points and paths between points and homotopies between paths. 
sort of equivalences between paths and so on. And on the other side, we have again, some clitoral sets. And they're characterized, again, they're characterized by zero simplices and one simplices. And two simplices, of course. And so on. So we can, by the just as we did above, we can take points and make them zero simplices, and take paths and make them uh, one simplices, and so on. And this forms a functor, which we'll denote by sing, and we'll call it the singular complex functor. I'll just write singular here. Uh, and this functor, the singular complex fun functor, takes a topological space and forms a simplicial set called its uh, singular complex. And it's left to joint, the functor going the other way, will denote like this. That is where we have, if we have a simplicial set, we'll put it in brackets to show the realization. And it's called the geometric realization. I'll just write geometric here. So we have the, again, a joint pair between the category of topological spaces and the category of simplicial sets. So let's consider uh, some important uh, topological spaces. So of crucial importance, of one of the crucial topological spaces we'll be dealing with here is the closed unit n ball. So we'll let uh, dn be the closed unit n ball. And that's just a ball. It's just a ball, a Euclidean ball in n dimensions. And we're going to denote its singular complex by this with uppercase delta, uh, to the n. And we'll call this uh, this simplicial set the nth fundamental simplex. So we can also form a subset of the nth fundamental simplex that we call the ith horn. And this is formed just by removing the interior of the by removing the interior of the nth fundamental simplex and the ith phase. So uh, an important fact is that we can consider we can consider an n ball of any topological space. That is, we can consider a subset in any a subset of any topological space um, that is homeomorphic to the n ball. So, uh, for some space W, so for some topological space, for some topological space W, we'll write the unit, the closed unit n ball of that topological space like this, where we call, we'll call this the geometric realization of the nth fundamental simplex in W, and we'll denote uh, the realization of the horn in W like this. And an important result of topology is that we have a map called the retract, which will denote R W that goes from the realization of the nth fundamental simplex, the n ball, and goes to the topological, I'll call the realization of 
the horn, the anthropological horn, the anthropological horn. And this is essentially a reverse of the embedding. You know, the embedding, um, the map that just takes the IF topological horn and takes it to the IF topological horn as a, as a subset of the end ball is the embedding. But in between these topological spaces, we have a reverse of that, not quite, a, perhaps not quite an inverse, but a reverse of that that goes in the other direction. This is called the retract. So how are you, how are you realizing them inside of a topological space? Um, in an, uh, every topological space has a subset that's hope, homeomor homeomorphic to the end ball. So we just call that homeomorphic subset the realization in the topological space. Well, that's not entirely true, I don't think, but I think you can realize the uh, simplex doing the normal uh, geometric realization and then consider um, monomorphisms from that realization into your space. Doesn't yeah, necessarily need to be a homeomorphism, but I think that's what you mean when you say subset. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. That's, that's okay. what I mean. All right. Uh, I think that's what I mean. Yes. Uh, this is the blue I'm using. Uh, so we can consider. So now I'm going to introduce con complexes. Not the nicest blue, but it'll do. By the way, uh, make sure if you see anything here that uh, doesn't look right that I'm doing, uh, make sure to mention it because sometimes it might be that I'm uh, omitting something and sometimes it might be that I missed something. So make sure to let me know. So let's consider that we have some map which will label GI between the i-th horn and some simplicial set K. Now naturally we have the embedding, which I mentioned above, of the simplicial set in the nth fundamental simplex. And uh, I'll denote the embedding HI. And essentially, a simplicial set K is a con complex if for any G i -th horn and uh, map G i from the i -th horn to K, we have a uh, map F i from the nth fundamental simplex to K, making this diagram commute. That is such that F i composite. H i equals G i. That is that the image, if we just compose these, is the same as the image if we just did G i directly. So now we're going to go to infinity categories and we'll see why the con complex um, is useful. So roughly an infinity category, and I won't go how this works precise and how I won't go into how this works precisely. But essentially, an infinity category is a category with higher level structures, but I'll just treat these as maps. So we have, we sort of have maps between maps and so on. So it so happens that a category enriched over the category of con complexes, that is such that uh, the set of morphisms between any two objects A and B in the category um, is a con complex.
then the middle of that category shall just call n. n is an infinite category. So let's give an important example of an infinity category. In fact, of an infinity category, yes. Then, in fact, of an infinity topis. So Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, just before you get started, I have a question. Uh, is this F sub i in the definition of the con, con complex, is that supposed to be unique or does it just need to exist? Uh, it doesn't need to be unique. There's actually, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I believe if it is unique, then K is an infinity groupoid, but it doesn't need to be unique in general. All right, thank you. You can think of the F as, uh, as like a retraction. So yeah, it is like an attraction. In fact, that's how we'll sort of use it later. Uh, or rather, we'll use it attraction to construct F. Uh, so I'll mention an important. So the infinity category of spaces, the infamous infinity category of spaces. Um, is just defined to be the nerve of the category of all con complexes. And it so happens that the category of con complexes is enriched over itself. Um, the set of maps between any two con complexes is all, itself a con complex. And so the infinity category of spaces is indeed an infinity category. So now I'm going to define what an infinity topus is. Um, so I'm going to give the technical definition, uh, but you don't need to worry if, but I won't, and I won't go into it too much, but you don't need to worry about uh, the definition because we have a nice trick so that we won't have to worry about it. So a category is an infinity category if there's a special kind of functor um, called an accessible left exact localization functor. That goes from the category of pre-sheaves for some category C to I. So what does this mean exactly? And what is pre-sheaves? Well, it doesn't really it matter because of this nice trick that I'm about to show. Um, I'm gonna go this, about this a little heuristically, but um, if you don't understand it, uh, feel free to ask. So suppose um, X is a subcategory of the category of con complexes. Well, we know that the infinity category spaces is an infinity topus. It's the archetypal infinity topus. So we know that there exists some category C such that the category of pre-sheaves has the desired functor to the nerve of the category, of, to the category of spaces, which we'll just denote by that nerve of the category of con complexes here. So essentially this functor becomes the same kind of functor in the realization, or well, roughly, essentially, um, and this becomes this functor. We have this embedding, and we can just restrict the image of this, or the restriction of this functor, we get this functor, and then Taking the nerve, a little better. This will also be a category of pre sheaves. We get a nice desirable functor to the nerve of X that makes the nerve of X an infinity topus. So now let's go back to what a Grassmannian is. 
So uh, you say that this N of uh, the realization of P of C is a pre-sheaf category. Um, how, how is it? Does the it's not exactly that it's a pre-sheaf category, but it can be shown. Uh, I, I'm not sure I have enough time to show it, but I can show that the okay. nerve of the realization of the pre-sheaf category will be a pre-sheaf category and that this functor will have that desired uh, relation. Okay. Uh, I will probably actually be writing this in a report soon, and so I'll post that when it's done. It'll be in more detail. Okay, sounds good. Sure. So uh, let's consider, so now let's go back to what a Grassmannian is. That's the, that's the exciting stuff. No, I'm kidding. Um, the exciting stuff is how this connects to this, how the gas medium connects to this stuff. So a gas, let's say we have a Hilbert space, which is just a vector space, but it can be an infinite dimensional vector space. Or in fact, it can be a space of some arbitrary uh, transfinite dimension. And, uh, uh, and we're going to assume that this Hilbert space has a decomposition. And I'll explain in a moment what this means. So these are two Hilbert spaces, and this is the direct sum, which means that this Hilbert space can be considered as the space of ordered pairs of the elements of these spaces. So now we say, so now we're considering the subspaces of H. And we say that the subspace of H is an element of the Grassmannian if it had fulfills two properties. One, there exists a special map called the Fred Horn operator that takes W to H plus. And Fred Holm just means that the kernel and co-kernel of the transformation are finite. That's all it means. So write that down quickly. All right. Uh, and it also has a map. which will denote T minus, even though we won't really be using it much, from W to H minus. And what it means for it to be compact, we won't really be using it much. Um, it's just that it takes bounded subsets to relatively compact, it takes bounded subsets of H to relatively compact subsets of H minus and a relatively compact subset is a subset whose closure is compact. So if you take the set and you take all of its limit points, then that's compact. Uh, but we won't really be dealing with this one much. We'll just be working mostly with the Fred Holm one. So we say that the virtual dimension of this space, W, assuming that it has these properties, is the difference between the dimension of the kernel of T plus and the dimension of the co-kernel. And uh, because by, my, by hypothesis, these are two things are always gonna be finite, this index is always going to exist for any space in the Grassmannian. So we know that in a Hilbert space, there are various operators that take subspaces to other subspaces, and we'll be dealing, and certain of those operators are going to act on the Grassmannian. And these operators can be written, written in matrix form like this. Um, but these aren't numbers. Uh, these are also operators. And in particular, B and C are compact operators, and A and D are Fred Holm operators. But the important point 
is that when you apply an operator, when you apply this operator to any sub to any space W in the Grassmannian, the resulting index is the index of W plus the index of A, where A is an operator, and we say that the index of A is just is just this with A instead of T plus. Oh, this should be T plus. Um, and so this is a little bit of abusive notation that these are actually referring to slightly different things. This is virtual dimension, so it's the index of T plus, but this is actually the index of A itself, the Fred Holm index. So uh, now is the part that's a little less intuitive. We're going to construct a simplicial set from the Grassmannian. So I'll write it down just as an announcement. Don't know what happened there. So this part's a little difficult to I, to think about. Um, instead of con doing of constructing a simplicial, we're going to construct a simplicial set. Instead of taking a map from the Grassmannian to the simplicial set, we're going to show that the Grassmannian, in a sense, is a simplicial set, and we're going to do that by doing something a little odd, which is parsing it. And we're going to say that the set Sn is a set of spaces in W with index n. So an important point is that we have that the special case of these operators that we have above here where the index of A is plus minus one, we'll treat those as the face and degeneracy maps. And minus for minus one, it's clearly a face map because we take subspaces of uh, index n and we turn them into spaces of index n minus one and then plus one it obviously takes it the other way so it's a degeneracy map so for those of you who are familiar with the uh, identities that these maps are supposed to satisfy when you substitute these operators in for the into these ide the identities um, you get actually a set of linear uh, you get essentially a system of linear equations and because they are not identically inconsistent, there exist simplicial sets, and because of the excess of parameters, B, C, and D, for the various operators involved, we get that um, the system is always solvable. So that these in indeed are, we can choose them so that they do satisfy the identities and are simplicial maps. Uh, but I won't. Uh, but I won't show that uh, here. But actually, an important note here is that the choice of simplicial maps among these operators is not unique. We can make an arbitrary choice of a few of the operators and then uh, construct the rest of the maps inductively. Um, so the construction as a simplicial set is a little arbitrary in that sense. Um, but I won't give an explicit construction uh, here, and I'll just go to the conceptual ideas. So let's consider the realization. And essentially, uh, what we're saying here is uh, it's equivalent to what we have here, that if the realization of a simplicial set is a subcategory of the category of con complexes, then the simplicial set is an infinity topos. So that's what we're going to do here. Put this a little higher. So 
So we're going to consider the realization of this simplicial set. And the realization is naturally a simplicial category uh, by definition. But an interesting property of this simplicial category, as usual, the HOM, the HOM sets, the set of sets of maps between objects are going to be, uh, they're going to be simplicial sets. But when we take this construction, the maps between objects are going to be spaces and the maps between those maps are also going to be spaces. And because the, because of the choice of association of these spaces with, of these maps with the objects they map between is essentially arbitrary. Um, the spaces themselves have to be simplicial sets in order for this to be in a simplicial category in order for it to be simplicially enriched. So we get by that reasoning, the awfully strange case that the spaces are themselves simplicial sets. That is not that they're singular complex or something is simplicial set, they are themselves simplicial sets which is odd, but how it is. Um, so now we want to show that these spaces are con-complexes because then we'll, uh, we'll get the desired result. So let's consider that we have a horn, the i-th horn, and we have a map to W that as above, we'll label GI. We have this embedding of the i-th horn in the nth fundamental simplex, which we'll call HI. And we want to know if there, if there always will exist for any GI, a map FI making this diagram commute. So let's define U to be the image of GI in W. So we have, so here's how we're going to construct FI. So let's take the nth simplex. We can construct essentially serialization in W. And then we get our tract that takes it to the horn in W. And then essentially this, the i-th horn is related uniquely to you. So it follows that this is related uniquely to you and that's manifested in a map, which will denote ui to you. And Clearly, Fi is the desired map, and Fi composite G, Hi is Gi. So W is a con complex. So I, I have a I have a question. I, sure. I, sorry if I cut you off. Um, sure, no problem. But um, yeah, you're you're writing like uh, you're you're writing the realization of the n simplex in W. You're using the word the. You know, is this is this a special uh, n simplex in W, or is this an arbitrary n simplex? Uh, it can w? be arbitrary, yeah. But it will can be shown that it does have a retract, and then this that will be. Uh, relate to you in a desired way. Okay. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to see is why the W matters here, because it, you're mapping into U anyway. So like the, the W is implicitly saying that there's a mapping from this geometric realization into W, if I understand that correctly. Sure. Um, 
but maybe that's just a technicality that doesn't matter. So. Uh, well, actually, it's a good question because um, I also was thinking I was thinking about this a lot, and the idea here is that there isn't always going to be, there's obviously not going to be a retract for any simplicial every simplicial set that will have this property. Um, but this actually follows from the argument that uh, the singular complex of a topological, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the argument that the singular complex of a topological space is a con complex. Okay, yeah. So it follows by the retract of these, not in W, but of the, G, uh, in general, the geometric realization of these, that it follows from the retract that you can form a morphism like this, just by taking the retract and composing it with the given morphism. Oh Sometimes. yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I buy that for sure. I was wondering what the, if the W in this uh, sequence actually mattered. Um, so the W, the only reason I have a W here is because is to specify that this is a special result of W being both a simplicial set and a topological space that okay. we can essentially map it to um, a subset of W which acts like the um, realization of the nth simplex in the category of topological spaces. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that answers my question. Oh, good. All right, uh, well, I guess the last point is just the result um, because the realization, so we have, uh, like in blue. Um, because the realization is a subcategory of Khan, the category of Khan complexes, um, it follows that the Grassmannian is an infinity topos. So uh, an important question, well, this is the desired result, uh, which is why I included the homos box here. But why does this matter? Why is it physically relevant? Well, I began uh, by talking about constructive physics, and there has been a lot of work um, on constructing physical theories from homotopy type theory, in particular uh, modal homotopy type theory. And uh, there's a, a great work by Urs Schreiber on the subject um, in which he essentially uh, derived Lagrangian mechanics within, an infinity to within infinity topuses. And the interesting point of this uh, result is that it gives us, reversing the construction here essentially gives the specification of the gas manian as an infinity topus and in an infinity topus. And because of the unique relationship of the gas manian with integrable systems, which are in turn uniquely related to wave phenomena, we get here a specification of wave phenomena in infinity topuses. Uh, and that's special by the, uh, well, I think it's special um, because this, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this talk, uh, the idea here really is to take this, um, these physical phenomena and the models for these physical phenomena and abstract them to get a concept, fundamental concept like this, where we can now deal with fundamental logical issues, like what's possible, what's even undecidable. Um, uh, and I think this gives it that sort of fundamental abstract perspective where we can study those types of properties. So now that I see that I have, I am in the uh, scary position that I finished, I've gone through all of my notes and that there's still 20 minutes, I might as well discuss some of the interesting properties of this as an infinity topos, if that's all right with everyone. Yeah, go for it. Don't feel like you need to fill time, but it sounds interesting. Sure. 
So I think one of the really interesting, I, if you remember from my talk, uh, how long was it? Like it must have been like a month ago. Um, but I originally, the original idea was to represent um, this Grassmannian as an enriched category. Um, and to consider that uh, maps between them are Lie groups or Lie group points or something like that. So we obviously, we clearly don't have an enrichment and we don't even have a homotopy enrichment, if you're familiar with that, because the spaces that form essentially the morphisms are uh, clearly not um, Lie group points or anything like that. But an interesting point is if, uh, I'll just write this here, uh, we have a, we can actually define a set of endofunctors, a category of endofunctors. So just a category um, of fun endofunctors, G, I'll write them G naught from the Grassmannian to itself. And it's interesting that we, these endofunctors, or at least some of these endofunctors, are the, those operators like this, such that the index of A equals zero, because then this just takes zero simplices to zero simplices and one simplices to one simplices and so on. So in this, we actually get the interesting like, uh, property that the uh, subcategory of the endofunctor category, I don't know if these are all the endofunctors, they might be, I, have, I, I just don't know. Um, uh, the subcategory of endofunctor categories is actually a group, it's actually a Lie group, which is sort of odd. And then uh, I don't know, I've tried to look if there's any uh, literature on stuff like that, that you might, uh, some of you might be more, some of you might know something, uh, some literature about that. In particular, what a name for something like this would be. I was thinking of saying that, um, the grass mainly is, is encircled by uh, G, where G is the set of all of these index zero operators. I don't know if there's any known term for, I don't know if there's a term for this. It doesn't seem like it's uh, something so foreign, but they can find a term for it. Uh, before I uh, get to some other interesting cardinality properties, I'll actually make a quick note about this proof and what was used to, uh, I forgot that I actually had a few comments I wanted to say about the uh, properties of the proof. Um, essentially, the main properties that we used here were that the Grassmannian is a sort of classifier of spaces and these spaces have an indexing and this indexing, um, and we have operators that um, change the indexing in a known way. And intuitively that makes sense. Um, I was startled at first when I uh, worked out this proof that it seems a little too general, but it intuitively makes sense because essentially what we're saying, what it's an infinity topus, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're saying that it's similar to the category of spaces and it makes sense that something that classifies spaces and has the additional operator properties that we mentioned um, should be similar to the category of spaces. So an interesting note, um, and the last thing I'll, s and actually one of the t last two things that I'll say before um, I stop for questions is that um, this should be generalizable. And uh, I watched uh, Uhlenbeck's lecture on the calculus of variations um, at the Institute for Advanced Study at, uh, 10 days ago, I think. Uh, it was on Zoom. Did any, uh, any of you see it? take that as no. Um, but essentially, variational problems, the solutions of variational problems can be written as, can be represented as moduli spaces. 
So it makes sense that we can consist, consider infinite systems of variational problems and get um, a similar classifier of moduli spaces and be able to represent, and we should be able to represent in the same way. I haven't worked out exactly how you construct the index, uh, the face and degeneracy maps yet. Uh, and I think that's, that's all that I have. So does anyone have any questions? Great, well, thank you. That was a good lecture. Uh, I, I have uh, some questions actually. Sure. Um, so can you go up to where you define uh, the Grossmannian as a simplicial set? Um, yeah. yeah, right there. So, well, for, I guess this is a two-part question. What are the A, B, C, and D in this sort of matrix that you wrote? Oh, uh, they, these are operators. Uh, they, they operate on H plus and H minus independently? They operate, yeah, they operate on the, uh, the Hilbert space, yeah. Okay, uh, but like seeing it as uh, um, a sum of H plus and H minus. Yeah. Okay, um, and so when you write like the, um, uh, the, the face maps are, are sort of indexed by these A's, mm -hmm. um, it seems like the, there's a lot of different A's, a lot of different operators. Yes. That maybe you would get more operators than there are face maps in a, in a traditional simplicity no, set. You, so. you definitely do. And that's what I mentioned that uh, this is that essentially the construction of a simplicial set from GR is uh, from the grass green is essentially a little arbitrary. And actually it's the arbitrariness that goes into this part of the proof because you can actually construct a simplicial set in a way so that the harm set is just a single space W. For any space W, you can give it to such a construction and here we, so that's how we actually get that these need to be simplicial sets. But yeah, essentially you could have way more, you definitely do have way more operators of this form than there are face and degeneracy maps between the simplicial sets. But they are, I guess they're spanned by only n different a's. So, oh, so you're, that, you're thinking about how uh, other operators need to be uh, de be able to decom be decompose into those maps. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. So that for yeah, n exactly. simplex to get n plus one faces and not, you know. Yeah, you do have when you. Uh, when you work this out as like a linear algebra, you, it sort of becomes similar to linear algebra just with uh, operators instead of numbers. When you work this out, you do get uh, that you, you, get, you can get a basis and obviously you can choose multiple bases, um, but you get a basis and then the rest of the operators are spanned by. Um, okay, I see. So when you say arbitrary, you're saying from that choice of basis, we get a simplicial set. Yes. An actual simplicial set. Okay, okay, sure. Yeah. 